All right, so good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Lecture 24, DH 870, quantum computation. So in the last class, I had started talking about linear codes, right? And before that, I briefly discussed the general theory of quantum error correction. So the salient points are the following, right? And then of course, there's some terminology, some definitions, the weight of an operator and so on and so forth. Right, so the general theory of quantum error correction says that you have some Hilbert space, which is where you will encode your data. There is some subspace of that, which is called the code subspace. And there is, there is a set of operations, which are, which are the errors. And there's a set of operations called the recovery. The recovery and the error oper operations should satisfy this requirement for all states in the code subspace, which is, uh, Obvious, right? It's a tautology. So the non trivial condition is the following, right? Is this, right? And so this equation encodes ex is the mathematical expression for two conditions, two physical conditions. The first is that the errors should not overlap. Right? If you have an error on a code word and a an different error on a different code word, the resulting corrupted states should be orthogonal to each other. Because if they are not orthogonal, you can't correct errors. And the second thing is for different errors on the same code word, the result should not depend on the code word. Okay, so for this second condition, I think I've not given such a physical or intuitive explanation. Um, if I if I happen to come up with something, I'll, I'll I'll share it with you. And if you do, you share it with me. Okay. Now, there is a very general procedure for constructing kick codes, which is based on linear coding theory. So the theory of linear codes says basically that you have some k bits of information and you encode that into an n bit code space. So now we're talking about classical bits at this stage. What happens is that as we study this theory, we uh, reach, uh, we, there's a concept called dual and self dual codes. And when we get to that, it turns out that it becomes very easy to, to take such dual and self-dual codes, classical codes, and quantize them. So you can construct families of quantum error correcting codes directly from, and there's a large library of, right? Huge amount of work has been done on linear codes, classical codes. So the code, this theory is, says that you have a generator matrix, which is an N by a K matrix. The way I've drawn it is slightly misleading because K is less than N, right? So it should be like this because, right? And then the way you encode something in, the, in this is that you take some message Right, it's a k, k bit message, so it's a vector, a k bit vector, and you multiply it by this matrix, you get an n bit vector. That n bit vector is your encoded vector, encoded message. Right, so this is where we were yesterday. As an example, right, so this is called this is the six to code, six being. N, two being K, 
right? And this is our generator matrix. So our possible messages, since we have two bits, these are the set of possible messages. When we act upon this with G, these are the outputs, right? So these are the, uh, these are the code words, right? And the set of possible code words, right? Corresponds to a vector space. What is that vector space? It is a vector space which is spanned by these two column vectors, right? These are two column vectors. So any two vectors or any n vectors, whatever, will give you a vector space as long as they are orthogonal. And you can see these two vectors are orthogonal, right? They don't have any components in common. And this vector space is a vector space over the field Z2. Okay, so that means alpha, beta are ele elements of Z2, zero or one. And all addition, subtraction, everything is done modulo two. So if you take these two as your basis vectors and alpha, beta, your set of coefficients, you take all the possible set of coefficients, which is what? Zero, one, one, zero, 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 and one. So all of the vectors, right? In this case, this vector space only has four vectors, right? It's still a vector space. It, all the usual um, rules of a vector space apply to this. You can take an inner product. You can have an orthogonal basis. Everything, all of that you can do. So the set of possible code words corresponds to vectors in this, in the vector space spanned by the columns of the generator matrix. So this is where we were yesterday, right? Now the question is how can one uh, decode such a message, right? First of all, if there is an error, how do you determine what, an, what, uh, what the error is and how do you correct it? So for this purpose, we introduce another object, which is called the parity check matrix. Okay, so we have the generator matrix. We introduce the parity check matrix. Okay. This is a, so the dimension of this matrix is N minus K times k, okay? So that means n minus k rows and k columns. Oh, sorry, not, not a, my bad, n, n columns, right? And just to, for reference, let's see what the generator matrix is. It's an n by k matrix, right? So n rows and k columns. What is the what is the procedure for for encoding? We have a message, right? X. This is our message dimension of X. Uh, Uksa, can you please just open the door a little bit because I think if the AC keeps running, I think it will become very like. So dimension. So this is a. This is your message, right? Which you want to encode. How do you encode it? Right? You take the generator matrix, act on X. This gives you Y. Dimension of Y is equal to N. Right? And this is your encoded message. You have taken K, you have taken a K bit message and encoded it into an N bit vector, right? Now, how do you decode it? Well, first you want to, uh, so you want to see if there is an error, right? So let's say there is an error. And that error changes your, corrupts your message. This is your encoded message. It is corrupted so that 
the new message is your old message plus some error D. Okay. And for simplicity, we'll take E to be uh, an element of the n unit vectors. So what does that mean? If you have an error in the ith bit, right? Error in the ith bit. How do you represent that error? You represent it by a vector which is zero everywhere except in the ith index. Right, where it's one. So you have your, me your message, which is some n component vector. This is your encoded message. Then you have an error on the ith bit, right? What happens? You get y1, y2, yi plus and remember which plus? Modulo two, that is XOR, right? XOR is what? It's addition mod, mod two, right? One zero is one, zero one is one, one one is two, two mod two is zero. So this becomes YI plus one, and all the others are unchanged. Okay, so this is your, this is your corrupted message. Okay, now what does the, what is the role of this parity check matrix? This parity check matrix is of dimension N minus K times N. So you might think, well, it might have something to do with decoding the message. So we take this parity check matrix and we act on it on the corrupted message. We don't know if it's corrupted at this point. We just act on it with the message, right? So the setup would be that you have Bob over here, Alice over here, right? Bob takes some message, encodes it using the generator matrix, transmits it to Alice. In the process of transmission, there is some error that, then how does Alice determine if the message is corrupted? Well, she has this matrix, this parity check matrix. She acts on the corrupted message with, with this, okay? So what is this? This is going to be equal to Y plus EI, okay? So what do I mean by EI, by the way? Don't confuse this. This is just means EI is the vector is the with where only the ith index is one. Everything else is, okay? So it's like a unit vector. So this is equal to HY. Yes. Okay. Now we impose the following condition. We require that, so far we have not said anything about what sort of condition is satisfied by this H matrix, right? We require that H acting on Y is equal to zero for all Y in C. Where what is C? C is the set of all the code words, right? What are the code words? What is a set of code words? It is a set of all messages acted upon by the generator matrix. That will give you the set of the code words, right? So this means that all code words, another way of saying this, live in the kernel of this matrix H, okay? So the kernel of any matrix is the set of vectors which are annihilated by that matrix. 
okay um as an example i mean if you want to just look at a very simple let's say you have a matrix which i'll write like this um okay i want to ask what is the the kernel of this matrix so if you take a and you act on 0 1 right you get 1 0 and if you take a and act on 1 0 then you get 0 so this is the kernel of this matrix right this vector the reason i have chosen this example is because in quantum mechanics this is a representation for an annihilation operator this is the uh so actually i should say creation operator this is the up this is the down state this is the oops up state right so the creation operator takes a down spin and converts it to an up spin and it takes the up spin and converts it to zero in the case of spin one half system if you are not you don't have the physics background you don't follow this don't worry about it okay this is the physics people here even the physics people don't have physics background sometimes so anyways so you understand the kernel is the subset is a subspace which is annihilated by any matrix right you you understand right that given any matrix given any matrix there can be some set of vectors on which the action of that matrix gives you right that set might be zero but if it's not zero as in this case then what happens is this condition implies that what is the action of h on the y prime which is the corrupted message this gives us zero the first term and the second term is h acting on ei right and ei is a n dimensional vector h is a n minus k times n dimensional vector so this is a n minus k dimensional vector right so what does alice do alice has a set of such vectors she has already calculated those vectors for each i because you have how many i's you have n possible i's right so alice takes those n possible errors multiplies them by the parity check matrix right and she has a lookup table in that lookup table she has n minus k vectors she calculates this quantity right if this quantity is zero then again under the assumption of single qubit or single bit errors she is happy we take the message to be unchanged if it's not zero then she compares it compares the result to her lookup table she sees which index does this correspond to whichever index it corresponds to she flips that bit right so error correction is done okay yeah hmm uh, Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so this is zero, right? Yeah, yeah. 
सॉरी सो दिस इन दिस केस या दिस इज दी एनालिशन ओके now it takes a little bit of time just to get the steps in your head so let you know we can again just for the sake of completeness we have a message a k bit message x we encode right multiply by the generator matrix we transmit right or process or do whatever and in that process there is some error and then we have this parity check matrix the parity check matrix acting on this is not zero only if there is an error right because all of the code words why they lie in the kernel of h and so this is equal to 0 implies no error right not equal to 0 implies error use the lookup table right because you have the list of possible outcomes of h acting on any error and then you perform the correction accordingly okay now now there is a lot more uh, to be said about linear codes like that they you know first the the reference that i'm using is milson uh, and chuang and 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 there are it has lots of exercises which show all the various properties of these codes but i'm not covering all of that okay uh because well if i did it would take too long um now but this is just to give you the the general picture of what the linear code is okay now um so we need a couple more uh ideas concepts as we go forwards the first concept is that of hamming distance so hamming distance is named after a gentleman called hamming who in 1950 i believe uh, gave the hamming code so what is the hamming distance well first of all again we are talking about bit strings okay so we have x what does this notation mean this notation means an element either from 0 or 1 n times right so that means this is basically the set of set of strings of length n set bit strings of length n right okay and then we have the zero bit string obviously this is what we will call our origin okay we define the weight of any bit string as the number of non zero bits in the string so for example weight of 011 is 2 okay now if you have two different bit strings okay so y is also 
a bit string. The Hamming distance. So we can define a distance between any two bit strings, X and Y. So it is defined as the number of bit flips required to go from X to Y or from Y to X. So for example, if X is one, 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 zero, zero, one, Y is equal to zero, one, one, zero. The Hamming distance is how much? Four, right? So there is a formula for the Hamming distance in terms of the weight, which is as follows. It is the weight of X plus y and again plus is the binary addition. So in this example, x y plus y will give me what? It will give me one, 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 one. The weight of this is four. We can see the Hamming distance is also four. So I'm not, I don't have a proof of this, but you can convince yourself with uh, several examples that this is indeed true. It's not obvious that this should be the case, but, but it is. Now, why is this, what, what is the, this Hamming distance and all of this, why, like how do we think of it? So as an example, let's think of, think of uh, something like a, a three bit code, okay? Like the repetition code. And, or even simpler, a two bit code, right? So what are the possible bit strings? Uh, one, one, right? Now I will say that zero, zero is my origin. Why did I use this term origin, right? because we have a vector space and this Hamming distance is a distance on that vector space. What are the points of this vector space? These are the elements of that vector space. You remember from last time, the set of possible vectors is the, constitute the vectors of, of some vector space. Right. So in this case, this is our origin. Then we have zero one. Okay. One zero and one one. Right. And We can go from one, each point to the other point by one bit flip. So when, when you think of, of space, right? When you think of Cartesian space, for instance, right? You say two points are close to each other, right? If if the distance between them is less, right? So how do you define this distance? One way to define the dis distance is, I mean, we can't really measure distances like in the, in the sense of like measuring the precise distance between any two points. What do we actually do, right? We do the following, right? We move a little bit in this direction, little bit in this direction, little bit in this direction, right? Imagine that, that, that you're playing a computer game.
so like like you are in a in a in a, on a pixelated screen you can't go from one point to another point diagonally you have to go like left right left right right so if you have two points right you have these these points a and b and then you have a third point c the distance between these right you would measure in the number of steps it takes to go from one point to another let's say right in the in this way the way that i have indicated something like this oops so when you talk about a discrete vector space like this right so this is a continuous vector space in this continuous vector space we can take limits and everything becomes a continuum but if you have a discrete vector space you can't do that so you are left with this picture of where you have to go step by step only but this is a bona fide vector space there's it is a vector space in every aspect okay so the hamming distance between each one of these points is one and the hamming distance between any two points over here 0 and 1 is when you go from here to here the hamming distance is 2 which in right and so geometrically also this this you can see is now this is for a two bit code now what about a three bit code a three bit code you can put on the corners of a of a cube exactly right so this is your origin 0 0 zero. Oh, oops right these are the points closest to your origin and then you can fill in the rest of the corners so the corner furthest away from the origin will be 1 1 1 and this will be what well you have this will be the point which is two steps away from 0 0 right so it has to be 1 0 1 is that two steps that's that's two steps So exact diagonal opposite zero and two steps. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah. So these two points are diagonally opposite. So the geometric picture works, right? So when you want to find a code, um, so how many possible code words are there? Uh, so you have. Um, you have a k bit message okay let me let me get my uh, this thing right um so what we want to do is the following we have n and k right and then we have a third parameter which is d we know what n and k are k is the message length n is the encoded message length what is d d is the hamming distance okay the minimum hamming distance between any any two code words okay now why is this important like why does it does it matter if the hamming distance between any two code words is more or less how many code words can you have you can have 2 to the n code words right maximum of 2 to the n code words so the amount of information that you can encode depends on how big your this 
spaces, right? The space of your code words. On the, uh, on the other hand, how many messages do you have? You have two to the K possible messages, right? So two to the K messages you have to encode in a space which is of dimension two to the N. Now, if the Hamming distance between your code words is large, okay? If, if D is large, For fixed n, for fixed n, then k will be small. Right? Because, for example, if you think about it in this repetition code, in the repetition code, in this three key, three bit case, your, uh, your code words are, your possible code words are zero. Well, your possible code words is this entire space. Your actual code words, you know, the ones in which correspond to your logical bits is zero, zero, zero and one, one, one. Now you want the Hamming distance between your, your code words to be as large as possible. Oh, and, and, and yeah, so now I, let me just correct myself. The number of code words is actually two to the K. It's equal to the number of possible messages, right? So for instance, if I want to encode a one bit uh, message, how many possibilities are there? There are two possibilities, zero and one. So the two code words are zero, zero, zero and one, one, one. These are my code words. I want my code words to be as distinguishable as possible. Right? So I want the Hamming distance between the code words to be as large as possible. Okay. But, um, so if you consider some, some fixed, okay, so let me also, rephrase myself. If you have for fixed K, right? And fixed D, what will happen to N? N will depend on the size of K and the size of D, right? As K increases, N will increase. As D increases, N will increase. And there will also be certain bounds. For instance, there will be values of K and D for which there is no N that is possible. Okay, so there is this uh, information density or coding this thing uh, efficiency, which is defined as um, K by N, right? So the number of uh, message bits divided by the number of, by the encoded message length. Right? So obviously you want this information density to be um, as close to one as possible. Because if it's small, the smaller it becomes, for instance, you're encoding a, a two bit message in a 20 bit string or a two bit message in a three bit string, which code is better? Two by 20 and two by three. Which one has greater information density? This one, right? Two by three. So you want this to be as close to one or as large as possible. But what happens is that you also want D to be as large as possible in order to ensure distinguishability of the messages. So in general, right, this is the problem is to find for given K, right? And for given N to find the encoding, which maximizes D. 
you can all you can also state it in differently you can say for given k and given d to find the find the encoding or find n right which is as small as possible so in general there is no known solution of this problem okay but this is how you measure whether a code is good or not that's why this hamming distance and this hamming distance provides us a a measure of that okay now um now i'll just tell you about dual and self dual codes uh okay so if c is an nkd code with generator matrix and i hope you all remember now what the generator matrix is what it does and a parity check matrix h okay so the full the full definition of the code is actually probably these five parameters so for such a code given any such code we can define a dual code okay which is written as c and this is the perpendicular symbol right there's a reason why we are using this because your code words remember they corresponded to some elements of vector space right so when you have some vector space and i have i have some vector space let's say something like this let's say my code words all live in the xy plane this forms a subspace right vxy then there is a in this case there is a one dimensional space vz right vz is what it's the subspace which is orthogonal to vxy given any vector space right you can write it as a union of some vector so if this is an n dimensional vector space you can write it as a union of a k dimensional vector space and an n minus k dimensional vector space which is orthogonal to the original one we can always do this na example i i give you some vector space which is let's say five dimensional okay there are five unit vectors e1 e2 e3 e4 and e5 right i can partition this into such vector spaces in many ways so for instance i can take this to be w right and this will be the orthogonal vector space this is also vector space right this is also vector space because these vectors are all orthogonal to each other e1 is orthogonal to e2 is a e3 e4 e5 so if i take some subspace those will also be vectors only right so that's where this dual code this notation is coming from so the definition of the dual code is the following the generator matrix of this dual code is the transpose of the parity check matrix of the original and the parity check matrix of the dual code is the transpose of the generator matrix of the original code right now how how does this make sense again 
you think about this what does the this duality transformation do it takes you from a k dimensional subspace to an n minus k dimensional subspace right so as an example right if you are if you have an nk code your g is what it's an n by k dimensional matrix okay again in your mind just remember that g is doing the encoding so it takes a k dimensional vector and gives you an n dimensional vector so it's an n by k matrix your h is an n minus k times n dimensional matrix okay now if you take the transpose of h you get a n times n minus k dimensional matrix right by definition and i am saying that this is equal this is the generator matrix of some dual code so if this is the generator matrix of the dual code right what is my message length what is k perpendicular so let me write this as n perpendicular and k perpendicular what is k perpendicular it's n minus k right and the generator matrix is n by k so i am saying that if i take the transpose of this that is a k by n dimensional matrix this is the parity check matrix right this number n remains the same though so this n perpendicular is equal to n right so a dual code this is the code and this is the dual right as an example um we have this hamming code the hamming code is a 74 code means it encodes uh, a four bit message in a seven bit length right so the dual of this will be a 73 code okay now a code is set called self dual right right if it is equal to if its dual is it equal to itself and it is this construction which can be directly taken over to the quantum case and this gives us something called css codes css codes are stand for calder bank shor and steel shor i'm sure you have heard everybody's calder bank and steel steel is actually andrew steel uh, he has written a very very beautiful book on special relativity which i have used in my relativistic physics class before so in case any of you are interested called bank i'm sure has done other things so so these are called css codes now the the short code that we were looking at the 9 qubit code it is a subset of these of these css codes okay um so this is self dual and then there is also the notion of weakly self dual i'll just mention that because that also seems to be important which is that uh, 
the uh, right if the code is um, is is a subset of its of its dual okay and so a subset of its dual means that uh, the the code words so one code is a subset of another code if if the code words of one set are a subset of the other right subset of the other code words of the code words of the others okay now let me uh, show you how these css codes come about now look i realize that not all of you or maybe none of you will be actually working in quantum computation maybe right maybe it will be a part of like whatever else you do and um whether or not error correction is a part of your duties or, or your interests right may or it may or may not be the case but again i mean it's like newton's laws right we teach you projectile motion and newton's laws and entropy and all of this and of course if you end up as a tech development lead or whatever for wipro or etc you won't use projectile motion in your daily life you won't use in your in your in your job but the knowledge of all of these different things right it allows you to first of all it allows you to understand whatever technologies are being developed right because without that understanding you can't meaningfully be a part of that ecosystem or play a role in in developing that ecosystem further you can't be of value to others so similarly all of this is an essential component right it's the core in fact of quantum computation because without error correction you don't have computation at all okay so so that is the utility and another reason is that since these sessions are being recorded this also serves as a introduction to anybody online who's interested in these topics and also for my own, my own self because i am also learning this process so anyway the point is that i'll be talking about these css codes and, and then what i'll do is um in our next lecture starting from monday onwards and i guess we have about maybe nine more classes left if i'm not mistaken so i'll i'll go back and i'll start talking about quantum phase estimation and then i'll talk about shor's algorithm which is the factorization algorithm right because that is uh what is said to be the definitive example of how quantum computers can change everything right because if you can factorize large numbers you can break rsa encryption which is at the root of all present internet transactions or digital transactions so obviously if you can break all those transactions then the world is in your hands and another another very very important um arena where where uh, this plays a role right we're talking about coding so coding also includes the no notion of cryptography what is cryptography right it is how you keep secrets in this we have been talking about how to correct errors but exactly the same technology can be used to hide messages also na you take a message and you scramble it up you take a k bit message and you scramble it up and you put it in some n n bit string 
So somebody reading that n bit string, unless they have the parity check matrix, right, will not know what message it is that you're trying to transmit. So error correction becomes cryptography, right? Now, where does cryptography matter? It matters in all, all sorts of transactions, right? Obviously. But there is a much more, much more topical and much more, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, well, I don't want to use the word fun, but I'm referring to war. In, in particular, we have this conflict, right? Ukraine, Russia going on. And Russia has suffered a lot of losses, as everybody knows at this point, except for Putin. And one of the reasons they have suffered these losses is, you know why? Because the Russians don't have encrypted communications. They have been using unencrypted mobile phones and ordinary radios. What happens if you are in a battlefield and you are communicating your positions to other units or your command is communicating the directions to you over unencrypted messages? you get screwed, right? So quantum, there, there is something called quantum key distribution and quantum cryptography. That will be the basis of the next generation of encrypted communications. How will you communicate with a drone, right? And this doesn't have to be for the purposes of war and combat only. It can be for something routine, like for instance, weather monitoring or disaster prevention or anything like that. You want to have a secure means of, of communication, right? Between any two agents. And that, that is going to be based on this quantum networks and quantum encryption. So, if you take a job in industry or technology and you don't know what is going on and as far as encryption is and coding is concerned, then your boss or your team leader is going to say, okay, you sit in the office and order pizza for others. And this other fellow there can like take on the other duty, right? Okay, with that, Lecture, I will take another five, 10 more minutes to tell you what CSS codes are, okay? So let me do that very quickly. CSS codes are the following. Suppose C1 is an N K1 code and C2 is a N K2 code. And these are linear codes. These are classical codes such that C2 is a subset of C1, okay? And C1 and C2 dual, right? Both correct T errors. T is whatever, some number, okay? We define an N K1 minus K2 quantum code, okay? And why K1 minus K2? Because we said that C2 is a subset of C1, right? So that means uh, K2 has to be less than K1. So N K1 minus K2 quantum code, which we will denote as CSS C1, C2, capable of correcting errors on T qubits, Okay, and the terminology is that this is called the CSS code of C1 over C2, and the construction is as follows. Okay, so if you have X, and this is a code word in C1. Okay, so again, what is a code word? It is an n-bit string 
right? Which represents a message of length uh, K1. So this is a code word. We define the quantum state X plus C2, okay? In the following way, let me write out the So this, um, this is the size of C2. What is this, uh, this norm of, uh, yeah, right, right. So this C2 is two to the power K2. Okay, it's the number of code words in C2. Why is the sum over all the code words of C2? And X plus Y is the bitwise addition of these two. Okay. Now, uh, the way this works is the following. Uh, that let um, X prime be an element of C1. Okay, such that X minus X prime is a code word in C2. Okay, so again, C2 is a subset of C1, right? So, and I have two code words, X and X prime in C1, such that the difference of these two is a code word in C2. Then the claim is the following that X plus C2 is equal to X prime plus C2. Okay. Now, why should this be the case? Can you see that immediately? X prime, X minus X prime belongs to C2, right? So let's say X minus X prime is um, W, which belongs to C2. So we can write X is equal to X prime plus W. So what is this X plus C2? We can write it as one over size of C2, Y in C2, right? Then X plus Y, we can write that as X prime plus W plus Y, right? And we are summing over all the possible code words in C2, right? And what is W? W is also code word in C2. And all the code words, they, if you combine any of them, you get another code word. So this gives you, you can, you can rewrite this as one by root C2, summation of Y prime C2, X prime plus Y prime, right? So this has the same form, okay? It's like, it's like when you take a, take a function and you translate it, Right? So you, ha you have the integral of some function fx dx. Right? You can also write this as integral of fx plus c, uh, plus c dx. Right? If you translate the limits. Right? So if this is from a to b, then a minus c, b minus c, this integral is the same. That's somewhat what, like what we're doing here. Okay? So this, this state X plus C2 is equivalent to the state X plus C2, X prime plus C2, right? So in other word, this state depends only on X minus X prime is equal to W. Okay. 
okay? Because if W changes, then you are no longer in the same equivalence class, right? So this is called an equivalence class. And look, if you're not able to follow this discussion, don't worry too much about it. This is a little bit more advanced. So we say X is equivalent to X prime. Uh, there is a geometric way to think about this. Imagine that you have any two points in some vector space or pairs of points, okay? You have X1 and X1 prime and X2 and X2 prime. We will say that these pairs of points form are elements of the same equivalence class if what? If x1 prime minus x1 is equal to x2 prime minus x2, right? So we can say that the first pair of points, let me call that A, and the second pair of points B, we, I can say that A is equivalent to B. This is called, this is the notion of, and this is an equivalence relation. Okay. So these two states, they belong to an equivalence class. And um, what this implies is that, well, you need the notion of something called a coset. But I have not explained to you what, the, what a coset is. Um, so I think I'll stop here for now. Okay. And then in, in the next class, we'll talk more about this. So as, as, a, as a, a preparation for this, uh, you should uh, read, uh, there is an appendix, uh, appendix two in uh, Nielsen and Chuang on group theory. Okay. We will need this appendix also for many purposes going forwards. Uh, so you will have to know a little bit of group theory, right? And everybody should know group theory. So this is something that can only be good for you, right? And I'll stop here today. And I'll stop the recording. <laughs>